In the headlines, regional investigators recommend that the police do more work in investigating the murder of Burby's teens Isaiah and Joel Henry and Harris Singh. Lagrange businesswoman found dead with hands and feet tied. Dr. Yesu Prasad is hailed for his selflessness as a clinical education center named after him opens. Chalkboards in communities as the Ministry of Education tries various methods to deliver the curriculum during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in sport, West Indies Chief Selector wants batsmen to score big as they prepare to face New Zealand. With the news, I'm Kurt Campbell. We're glad you can join us. First up, regional investigators have recommended that the Guyana Police Force do additional work in their investigations into the murder of Burby Steens, Isaiah and Joel Henry and Harris Singh. In a brief comment on Monday, President Irfan Ali confirmed that the report from the regional investigators was received, but said he has not yet seen it. Based on the MOU, the RSS report uh, was supposed to be submitted to the police force, and I'm, well, from what I've been told, it has been submitted. Does it, do you have, have you to seen see a copy? also? I have, not, I have not seen a copy of it, but I've been brief uh, on the content of it. And what I've been told is that um, the RSS they did some work. They recommended some, uh, some additional uh, work to be done. But in total, they were satisfied with the work that the local police has been doing. The mutilated bodies of Isaiah and Joel Henry were discovered in the backlands of Cotton Tree, West Coast, Burbese on September 6. The police had arrested approximately 27 persons, but all were released due to insufficient evidence as investigators found that the boys were killed elsewhere and dumped at the location. The police are also investigating the murder of Harris Singh. He was found dead in the back dams as protests rage over the murder of the Henry boys. The president subsequently engaged the regional security system to send a team to Guyana in support of the Guyana Police Force investigative capacity. We tell you now that an 86-year-old Lagrange West Bank Demerara woman was Sunday afternoon found dead in her home and with her hands and feet tied. She has been identified as Baby Ramjit. Police said the woman lived alone at Lot 63 Lagrange Old Road. She was killed sometime between 3 to 5 p.m., but up to news time, no one has been arrested. Police said the woman lived upstairs and operated the lower flat of her home as a grocery shop. At about 3 p.m., a 59-year-old farmer of a nearby village went to buy Edo's at the woman's shop, but she did not have change for his $5,000 note, and so he promised to return to pay her. Two hours later, the man returned to the shop and noticed the door to the shop as well as the back door to the upper flat were opened. He called out several times for Ramjit but got no response, and so he decided to head upstairs. There, he saw the woman lying motionless on her bed with her feet and hands tied. The man raised an alarm and the police were called in. The police checked the body for any marks of violence but said they found none. The police questioned several persons in the area but were unable to get any leads. A post-mortem is expected to be performed soon on the woman's body as the police continue their investigations. Nine regional chairpersons and vice chairpersons were Monday sworn in by President Irfan Ali. Among them was one female who is now the chair for a Region 2 Democratic Council. In an interview with the newsroom, Vilma da Silva said she is pleased to take up the opportunity to serve but encourages more women to step into leadership positions. The swearing-in ceremony was held at the Arthur Chong Conference Center, Liliandal East Coast, Demerara. The lone female chairperson is Vilma da Silva of Region 2. In an interview with the newsroom, da Silva said she is privileged to take up the position, which she will use to tackle several social issues in her region. Well, I feel great because, you know, being a woman, I'm always a strong woman and always in leadership role. I'm an entrepreneur by profession, have my own business. I manage people. So I think it's not challenging for me, but I'm surprised that not more women involved in the leadership role. We have a lot of delinquent children in society because um, young teenage pregnancy um, mothers not knowing enough before they go into parenting so that is an area that I, I will be looking at too. The regional chairman and vice chairman for region 8 were not sworn in as they have not yet been elected by their council. Minister of local government and regional development Nigel Dharamlal explained to the media that some councillors were tested positive for COVID-19 which prevented the meeting to select the regional leaders. 
However, he said now that those persons have recovered, this will be done in the new week. Delivering his charge to the newly elected leaders, President Irfan Ali urged them to serve in the interest of all Guyanese. It is not an easy task, but it must be a selfless task. It must be a task that we take seriously. Our oath of office and your oath of office today is one in which you would have committed yourself to serving the people of your regions without favor or fear, affection or ill will, which means basically that although we represent and you represent different political parties, by assuming the role of regional chair and vice chair, your conduct and action has to be for all the people of the regions. The regional democratic councils were dissolved earlier this year to pave the way for the holding of the March 2nd general and regional elections. Bibi Katoon, Newsroom. Police are investigating the murder of 33-year-old miner who was reportedly stabbed to the head and throat early Sunday morning in the CUNY Gold Mines. That is Allensford Sargon. Police said he worked at Quartzstone Back Dam in the CUNY River and was employed by another miner. The employer reported that he said Sargon Saturday night at about 9 p.m. and he, Sargon, left the camp and headed for Quartzstone Landing. At about 4.30 Sunday morning, the employer said he was awakened by someone who told him that he saw the suspect kill Sargon at the front of his shop. The police were called to the scene and when they examined the body, they found two inside wounds to Sargon's head and throat. The Minister of Housing and Water, Colin Crowell, over the weekend visited Region 7 and defended the government's move to distribute a cash grant of $25,000 to help families cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. The minister said the outreach to various communities by himself and other government ministers is a serious effort by the government to address vexing issues. So when they want to criticize the COVID relief and say $25,000 is not enough, they must think before they talk. That simple $25,000 for every household quantifies into a total of $4.5 billion for the entire country. Right away, although we were not getting much money flowing in, it was the president made available in the budget allocations to that truth. And that is compounded by another $2.3 billion for assistance in food hampers through the Prime Minister's office, with CDC, through the CDC program. So you understand where I'm coming from. So already, I am advised, your road here, is that so are you? is on your 2020 program and they have just done completed the evaluation to award a contract for, for doing some work here on your road. <laughs> so we don't wait. So this is not, as somebody said to me, the ministers are out in the field like if you have elections by the end of the year, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not about that. It is about ensuring that we make you happy. When you are happy, it means at our offices, we will start seeing less persons coming to the office. That's how I see it. All the ministers that are persons coming, they're coming to meet the ministers because why? They have problems. We may come to see the minister because he or he handsome or she pretty. They're coming because they have genuine concerns. So we need to be out here in your villages to help fix them to help make your lives better. That is why we are here. And that is what we are working towards. You may have issues that confront you beyond my ministry. I will be certainly sending that to the relevant ministers. And I'll share this much now. For our outreaches, we also have to share those issues at Kianet. So, there comes a time when the issues are not resolved and it reaches the president, somebody will have to answer, right? So we are trying to ensure that we have meaningful government and meaningful engagement. 
When the newsroom returns, Dr. Yasu Prasad is hailed for selflessness as a clinical education center named after him opens. Thank you watching the newsroom. Celebrated Guyanese philanthropist Dr. Yasu Prasad was at the weekend hailed for his continued selfless contribution to the advancement of Guyanese. He was being recognized for the role of the Yesu Prasad Foundation in raising over $200 million to construct a clinical education center in Georgetown. More in this report. I would personally want to dub this investment as the single greatest investment in medical education in the history of Guyana. And all of that must be applauded to Dr. Yesu Prasad. Please. Days after celebrating his 92nd birthday, Dr. Yasu Prasad has taken the spotlight again. This time, he's being hailed for accomplishing the single greatest achievement in medical education in the history of Ghana with the opening of a clinical education center named after him. The center was constructed in the compound of the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation and is expected to put an end to several of the woes faced by Guyanese undergraduate and postgraduate medical students. One of Dr. Prasad's friend and a respected medical professional himself, Dr. Madden Rambaran recalled the process to accomplishing the dream which was sponsored and managed by the Yasu Prasad Foundation. He said it wasn't without delays but acknowledged that it was a proud moment to witness the opening of the center several years after a casual conversation in Dr. Prasad's Kingston Georgetown office. I left him with a hmm and we will see. No promises. Nothing happened for several months. But in December 2015, I got a call to meet Dr. Prasad at the trust company Guyana Limited in Lamaha Street. There I met Dr. Prasad and Mrs. Gadraj, the managing director of the trust company. And I was told that Dr. Prasad, through the Yisu Prasad Foundation, was going to contribute 215 million Guyana dollars for the construction of a building to serve undergraduate and postgraduate medical education. The building will now serve as accommodation for administrative faculty offices, classrooms, conference rooms, and several categories of laboratories. Dr. Prasad's selfless contribution was also hailed by Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Dr. Paloma Mohammed, who noted that what it was a good moment for many Guyanese who would be deserving of studying there. But Dr. Prasad's most fun moment of the morning was the feature address delivered by President Irfan Ali and sharing the morning with the head of state. Dr. Ali said, Dr. Prasad's character is of a man who continues to do extraordinary things but remains simple and humble. He said Dr. Prasad has proven to be a man that reaches the unreachable and commended him for that. The president said it was a major investment in research and development. Perhaps the simplicity of this function represents the nature of the man himself. A man who has given his life for Guyana, who Guyana has given a lot to also. Guyana has given, given give him a lot. But more importantly, he has given back to Guyana and we owe him a resounding round of applause for this. Responding to commendations on his role in ensuring the dream was realized, Dr. Prasad recalled that when he was asked to participate in the project, he had to think many times. He recalled having to leave school at eight years old and now being a sought-after lecturer in the region and for other field, he's satisfied that he has made the investment. He said throughout his life's journey, helping persons who can't help themselves was always critical in his mind. Kurt Campbell, Newsroom. Esquibo police are investigating the death of a 59-year-old man who was struck off his bicycle by a speeding car. Dead is Tosaram Rajkumar, called Otam, of Golden Fleece, Esquibo Coast. Police said the driver of the car, a 57-year-old man of Golden Fleece, was allegedly speeding north and Mr. Rajkumar was heading in the other direction. The driver claimed that Rajkumar suddenly swerved into the path of his vehicle. Police said that as a result of the impact, the pedal cyclist was flung some distance away to the western lane where he sustained injuries about his head and body began bleeding profusely from his head. He was subsequently picked up in an unconscious condition and taken to the Sudi Public Hospital where he was pronounced dead on arrival. The driver of the motor car was arrested at the scene and taken to the Sudi Police Station and placed in custody. 
The Public Utilities Commission, which has oversight for utility companies in Guyana, will be reviewing its internal operations to manage the telecom sector, which is expected to explode with the liberalization of the sector. Telecom Sector Chairperson Della Britton announced during a virtual town hall meeting on Monday. Meanwhile, Complaints Manager Destra Bourne said that the, one, that the 715 complaints received for 2019, approximately 120, are still unresolved. It was also highlighted that for 2020, so far over 300 complaints were received. With this new telecoms regime, that we are in fact reviewing our, our um, standards, our internal sanctions policy to see how best A, it again, it can be exp expedited, and B, what sort of measures we need to put in place. Because as you would imagine, um, there is going to be probably a stampede on, uh, of, of complainants um, in, with respect to the new operators. For 2019, we would have received 715 complaints. We are working to resolve the remaining, which is approximately 120 matters. For 2020, we have received thus far 373 complaints, and we have 159 of those matters unresolved. Once a complaint is filed, well, of course, you, have, you would have had to seek redress with the utility before you come to the commission. Once you come to the commission and you file your complaint, we will then review that complaint because we have to make sure that the complaint that you're filing with us has merit. Once that complaint has merit, we will then take your complaint together with a letter from the utility, from the PUC and send that to the utility to hear the utility side of the story. Because before we can deal with any matter, we need to hear both sides of the story. We will send that letter to the utility and give them a time frame to respond to us. When they respond to us, we will then review based on what the customer would have brought to us and what the company would have responded to us. And that's when we make a decision on the matter or we ask for further information if further information is required. Andrew Mendez of Farfan and Mendez was this weekend recognized for his outstanding achievements in entrepreneurship when he received the Anthony N. Sapka Carbon Awards for Excellence. We tell you more of how Mendez moved the family business from logging to agriculture and now oil and gas in this report. Transforming a small family business that once sold transformers and logging tools into a national conglomerate has now landed Guyanese entrepreneur Andrew Mendez the prestigious Anthony N. Sapka Award, which is hailed as the Noble of the Caribbean. The recognition for Mendez includes the changes he spearheaded in not just his own business, but that of the local logging industry, making it more efficient and competitive. Mendez, who has written a book on logging and, and the code of practice for the local industry, is being recognized as spearheading a major major shift in how Guyanese logging companies compete abroad. Mendes explained why his innovations are aimed at conservation and extraction and how he was able to transform his family's business. You know, when I think back to the 70s and 80s, when we couldn't get foreign exchange, we couldn't get import licenses, and the Burnham regime took away our most profitable product line, essentially nationalized. And yet still, my parents never, ever laid off any staff as the company contracted. And still were able to put three sons through school and university in England. I, I to this day, do not know how they did it. President Efron Ali joined Guyanese in recognizing the achievements of Mendez as the recipient of the 2020 Anthony N. Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence in Entrepreneurship. The well-known businessman was among four persons in the region to receive the prestigious award this year, which honors people who have made significant contributions to the areas of art, entrepreneurship, civil society, and science. While the head of state lauded the Guyanese businessman for his achievement, he also charged him to inspire the next generation and to take the lead in building local capacity. Today, Andrew, I offer you a new challenge. As we prepare for the oil and gas sector, we have to ensure we prepare our people technically. I ask you to bring together similar minds in the private sector and let us discuss a common platform where the government can provide the technical institutions to equip 
our people, Guyanese and regional people, to benefit from the opportunities that our country would have in the future. This is a new area that will require your skills and the private sector skills. Dr. Ali charged Mr. Mendes to lead the way in bringing together similar minds in the private sector to bolster the country's technical capacity, particularly with the emerging oil and gas sector. President Ali also urged the laureate to use his platform to influence the change in mindset and mold the future that Guyana so badly needs. The profile of Mr. David Andrew Mendes, shared by Anthony N. Sabga Carbon Awards for Excellence, describes him as an entrepreneur who brings a welcome change to the extractive industry, logging and oil, which are becoming more unpopular due to environmental concerns. He's the managing director of Farfan and Mendez Limited. Mendez is also a passionate advocate of corporate responsibility, high quality customer service and products and improving standards. As well as giving back to his industry, Mr. Mendez gives back to the wider society, supporting various causes related to youth, community and conservation. He's an advocate and activist in addressing alcoholism, drug abuse and mental health in society through active support of groups that focus on these issues. Kurt Campbell. Newsroom. When the newsroom returns, talk boards in communities as the Ministry of Education tries various methods to deliver the curriculum during the COVID-19 pandemic. Watching the newsroom. Four chalk boards were installed at the weekend in communities across Georgetown by the Ministry of Education as part of plans to deliver education while schools is out because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Ministry, during a virtual meeting with teachers and the eventual reopening of schools for c and K students, stated that to make this happen, students, teachers and cleaners will be given vitamins and sanitary packages. The chalkboards were installed at the weekend outside of the Alboy Song Nursery School at the entrance of Rasville on Durban Street and in East Romveld in Georgetown. The Ministry of Education said the boards will assist students who do not have access to the internet or any other learning materials. It is part of efforts to deliver the curriculum during the COVID-19 pandemic. Teachers have been specially selected to ensure that the work is placed on the board. The initiative caters for children attending primary school. This initiative comes with its challenges. For example, when the newsroom visited the areas to work on the chalkboard, installed at Rasville was washed out by the rain. The teachers would have had to work to replace the work on the board. The ministry has also been distributing learning materials across the hinterland regions and has since moved this program to the coast in order to continue engaging students who are forced to stay at home due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The ministry also broadcasts various learning programs of the Ghana Learning Channel, e-networks, various radio stations and some students have engaged learning on Zoom and WhatsApp. Schools have been closed since March 17 as a result of the pandemic. While efforts are ongoing to return to the classrooms, the government last week said this may have to be done in phases, starting with grades 10 and 11 students who need to complete school-based assessments for 2021. Meanwhile, the ministry on Monday held a Zoom meeting with hundreds of teachers from Region 3 in Georgetown to discuss preparations for the 2021 Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate CSEC and the Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination. In a statement, Minister of Education Priya Manik Chan highlighted that presently, work is being done in schools across the country to prepare for an eventual reopening of schools. These works include the weeding of grass, installation of sinks, and toilets with running waters. Minister Manik Jan further stated that cleaners, teachers, and students will receive packages containing vitamins, masks, sanitizer, and alcohol sprays to ensure that they remain safe during school hours. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Pato. Scores of medical students at the tertiary level continue to shelf or delay the advancement of their local studies because of a lack of space that would allow them entry into the medical school of the University of Guyana. More in this report. Over 80 Guyanese have been granted scholarships for entry into the medical school of the University of Guyana this year. But the country's premier institution is giving early notice that it will have to turn away many of the eligible and deserving students, including scores more who will be applying outside of the scholarship program. In fact, the newsroom has learned that the medical school, recently renamed the College of Medicine, has been turning away between 100 to 150 students on an annual basis because of the lack of space for clinical rotation in the hospitals across the country. 
What that means is that there aren't enough beds in the country's hospitals to allow for the admission of patients that will in turn allow for studying doctors to have the level of patient interaction needed to complete their studies. With its international accreditation up for review by 2021 having been revoked in the past, UG's medical school is lobbying the government to help retain that accreditation amid a need for expansion of several programs at the master's and postgraduate level. In order to do so, the University of Guyana is requesting that the government move swiftly to upgrade regional hospitals throughout the country by expanding infrastructure and staffing. While not new, the appeal to the government came from Vice-Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Dr. Paloma Mohammed, who was pitched directly to President Irfan Ali at the weekend. That every single year, we tell students in this country that if you work hard, if you focus, if you study, if you burn the midnight oil, and you do well, we will ensure that you can realize your dreams. And guess what? When they get to the APEX institution, we have to say to them, many of them who are deserving, excellent students, we don't have space. You are eligible. You've done well. But the university does not have the space to train you. Mr. President, I want to address this directly with you this morning. Because you speak about dreams, and you speak to the young people of this country, and you know what it is like to be young and not to have an opportunity to do what you really want to do. The problem is not only space. The problem is the lack of spaces for clinical rotations in our hospitals. She said following talks with the Ministry of Health, the university has been able to increase the annual number from 40 to 50 students, but she lamented the fact that this is done while double that number continues to be turned away for a simple issue that can be fixed. In a separate interview with the newsroom on the sidelines of the event, Director of the Medical School, Dr. Rita Gobin, stressed that expanding regional hospital would also ensure that communities will be served better, but more importantly, it was also important in ensuring that the school keeps its accreditation. Full accreditation by the Jamaica-based Caribbean Accreditation Authority for Education, Medicine and Other Health Professions has only been restored in 2017. Dr. Gobin explained that part of keeping that accreditation requires that there are adequate number of patients for students to get exposure before they graduate. If you have a large number of students and a small number of beds, that, that doesn't happen. And so accreditation... Um, the, that you have to match exactly. doctors with patients. You have to have adequate numbers of patients for the students to get enough exposure before they graduate. So that when they graduate, they've had experience of interacting with patients. This is why you can't teach medicine online. You might be able to do the theory online, but you have to have the practice. In order to keep accreditation and to be considered worthy to train doctors, the school is required to ensure that they are doing clinical rotation in a hospital with 120 beds. The government has announced plans to upgrade the West Demerara study and Bartica hospitals. Kurt Campbell, Newsroom. The Rotary Club of Georgetown on Sunday held a motorcade through the city streets to raise awareness on polio, a virus which can lead to paralysis. The club holds a polio awareness walk annually, but this was switched to a motorcade this year due to COVID-19 pandemic. The vehicles departed the Georgetown Club at about 6.30 hours and ended at the parade ground. According to President of the Rotary Club of Georgetown, Clyde de Haas, the event is aimed at eradicating polio not only in Guyana, but around the world. The Rotary Club of Georgetown um, brought awareness with our motorcade to the er eradication of polio. Normally, World Polio Day is celebrated on September 24th and October 24th. And uh, the Rotary Club of Georgetown, normally we have a, a walk with uh, average about 100 persons. But in light of COVID-19, we could not do that. So we 
opted for a motorcade instead. It's uh, since 35 years that um, Road to International formed the Polio Plus Fund and um, since then more than 2 billion US dollars have been contributed by Rotarians worldwide, even Rotarians from Guyana. And with that fund around the world, we were able to immunize about 3 billion children. As you know, polio is uh, paralyzing and potential fatal disease and we are this close to eradicate polio it is worldwide it's about 99.9 percent .9 eradicated and rotary is pushing ahead to completely eradicate polio in the world When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Welcome back to the newsroom. We're starting off with some cricket news. Batting has grown to be the biggest headache for the West Indies team across formats, especially in test matches. Chief selector Roger Harper has thrown out a challenge to the batsmen to consistently produce big scores, which will help them to post huge totals. Akin Green reports. In a recent interview with Newsroom Sport, Harper admitted that batting has been a challenge for the test team and they are hoping the batsmen can raise their standards on an upcoming tour to New Zealand. He felt it was important and it becomes a norm of producing sizable totals. Batting has been a challenge in the test arena for quite a while and you know that's something we, we're trying to get right. Um, you know and we're looking to our players to make the strides forward in terms of once they get in, making bigger scores and, you know, being able to post bigger totals, especially in our first innings and be the bat more consistently in our second inning. To achieve such, Harper's looking at the regional 40 as a dress rehearsal for international cricket, as their batsmen can build habits of scoring hundreds consistently. However, look at last season charts with C, Jermaine Blackwood, topping with 768 runs at an average of just over 51. But he had just one century, a score of 248 to go with six half centuries. Kyle Mears had over 600 runs and just two centuries to go with five half centuries. After eight rounds, no batsman got more than two centuries. Only five were able to score more than one century. The 2018-2019 season, just four batsmen got two centuries, but there were numerous half centuries. In our original tournament, that's how you develop a habit of posting big scores and, you know, make consistency part of your natural makeup. So when you get to the higher, uh, more competitive international arena, it is just something that is part of you, mm. right? And not something that you, you, you're trying to do something you're not used to doing. So you're more likely to do it. And this is where you have to, to get to. Ideally, Harper wants better first innings totals, but better mental grit when it comes to the situation of fighting the saver test. One of the areas that I think we definitely have to improve on, you know, we seem to be able to chase targets to win or have a, you know, more confidence in doing that. But we do not seem to mentally be able to bat out periods to save a game. You know, if you look at the, the last game, you know, really, we had an opportunity to bat out there and save that game as well. You know, and we, you know, we didn't do that. So I think that those are areas, that's an area that we definitely have to improve on. And um, our batting, batting generally has to, you know, come good. The regional side will be up against a quality attack in New Zealand and a country where there is no rich history in touring. Of the 29 tests in New Zealand, they have only won 7 and drew 10. For the newsroom, Akim Green. We tell you now that the West Indian all-rounder Andre Russell will miss the upcoming Lankan Premier League after sustaining an injury in the IPL. 
While he has not called time on his IPL stint, it is suspected a knee injury which has kept him out of action is the cause for missing the league in Sri Lanka. Russell had opted to play in the Lankan Premier League instead of touring with the West Indies team for the three-match T20 series against New Zealand, happening concurrently with the league in November. His concern, according to the Cricket West Indies chief selector, Roger Harper, was dealing with one quarantine to another and he needed time to clear his head. Notably, players and officials of the Lankan Premier League could be required to undergo a mandatory 14-day quarantine ahead of the start of the league. Also set to miss the league are the South African pair Faf Duplessis and David Miller. Now, with their fifth win on the trot, Kings Eleven Punjab have surged into the top four of the IPL, beating Kolkata Knight Riders by eight wickets on Monday. Chasing 150, Kings Eleven were set on their way through an opening stand of 47 in eight overs between KL Rahul, who made 28, and Mandeep Singh. Singh and Chris Gale added 100 in 10.1 overs to bat KKR out of the game. Singh remained on the, to the end with 66 not out, while Gale cracked 51 of 29 with five sixes. Earlier, KKR were 10 for three by the second over before Shubman Gill and Iron Morgan repaired the innings with an 81-run stand. However, once both were dismissed, Gill for 57 and Morgan for 40, the innings subsided with only Lucky Ferguson among the runs at the bottom with 24 not out. Mohamed Shami claimed 3 for 35, Chris Jordan 2 for 25 and Rafi Lishnoi 2 for 20. IPL action continues tomorrow with Delhi Capitals playing Sunrise's Hyderabad from 10 hours in Dubai. Football news out of Ghana Football Federation has appointed a marketing committee for the Ghana Senior National Men's Team's participation in the FIFA World Cup qualifiers and the CONCACAF Gold Cup 2021. More in this report. The committee will be responsible for promoting the brand of the Golden Jaguars, coordinating public engagements and facilitating the creation of commercial sponsorship investments and corporate social responsibility partnerships. The five-member committee, whose mandate will be for one year, is an ad hoc one in accordance with Article 56 of the GFF Constitution. It consists of Lisa Ahmed, who is chairperson, Dion Innes, Dastani Barrow, Roger Rupchand and Orin Walton. Chairperson Ahmed said, as a sport enthusiast, it gives her great pleasure to chair the committee as they look to establish strategic partnerships with an intent to generate interest in the area of football. She said the terms of reference are very clear and that the mandate is to place the Golan Jaguars at the forefront of football, not only in Guyana, but on the world stage. President of the Guyana Football Federation, Wayne Ford, said the international successes of the Golan Jaguars over the past few years have significantly elevated the profile and visibility of the flagship brand. He said as a federation, they have seen very encouraging evidence of how this has helped to promote Guyana as an attractive tropical destination along with the consequential positive benefits to the international reputation of the GFF. He said and I quote, what is critical now is that we engage the broader Guyanese society here at home and abroad in ways that encourage greater support for the team and identification with the brand. There is also a plethora of commercial opportunities and relationships that will have to be carefully cultivated, leveraged and managed. The GFF Marketing Committee will be tasked with the responsibility for developing the strategies, policies and programs to achieve these objectives. End quote. The Golden Jaguars are down for a busy first half of 2021 to 22 World Cup qualifiers and the Gold Cup prelims. Ford had said that it would take six months of serious preparation to get the team in shape for those crucial tournaments. And Lewis Hamilton passed Valtteri Bottas to take a commanding victory in the Portuguese Grand Prix and break Formula One's all-time win record. Hamilton dropped to third in a manic first two laps that ended with McLaurin, Carlos Zins leading, but fought back to crush Bottas' hope. After both Mercedes passed Zins, Hamilton tracked Bottas before taking the lead on lap 20. From there, Hamilton dominated to take his 92nd career Grand Prix victory. His win on a humiliating day for his teammate Bottas gave Hamilton a 77 points advantage in the championship as he moves ever closer to a seventh world title which would match Schumacher's other surviving record. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. My name is Abhinash Ramzan. Thanks for watching.